What's going on guys, Mike Glover here today on this episode of, I don't know, you make up the title, I don't know. We're talking about gear, We're talking about things that I've used in the past in special operations and its application and evolution in civilian spaces. So today we're talking about specifically body army. Did I say body army? Body armor. Let's go. All right, guys, so this is a tier tactical vest, and I will tell you this because Jason Beck is a personal friend of mine, Chris uh, Van Zant and Lee Busby from Tier Tactical are some of the best people on the planet that I know. I'm letting you know that because I'm going to be biased, but I also have a lot of experience with Tier Tactical before I even knew the guys, and will tell you without a doubt, the best nylon, tactical nylon companies in my opinion, or Cry Precision, um, Tier Tactical, uh, London Bridge, Tactical Taylor, I, I haven't uh, messed with them in a long time, and First Spear. Those are a few of my favorites. GBRS does some side stuff like belts. I, I like their stuff as well, but I want to put that out there. So this is my civilian body armor. Now it's a little damp still because I did a workout this morning with my body armor. And a lot of guys will first go, oh, why are the civilians wearing the body armor in the range? And again, um, per our discussion and understanding about this idea of tactical advantage, why not? Like, why are you not doing that? Um, so let me, let me first say I hate body armor. I hate it. Um, not a big fan of it. When you live in the um, military, as like your life, like that's all you do. The military is not a job. You don't wake up and do, for some people it is, like you know, the cooks or the admin guys or the finance guys, no offense to those guys, but you kind of do your thing and then you go home and you check out. But it's very different for operators. Your life is immersed in this world. And this is one of the pieces of equipment that I hated the most. Because uh, operating with body armor means you're doing specific mission sets, like direct action raids, where you know you might take a casualty. Well, I know I'm landing a helicopter, I don't have to walk 15 miles. But sometimes those operations turn into, hey guess, you're walking 15 miles. What? Oh, the first thing people wanted to start doing is getting rid of the body armor. So I've also been on rural operations, kind of reconnaissance or special reconnaissance based Remember, I'm a sniper by trade in special operations, like a designated sniper, meaning my job was that. But I also ran sniper detachments. And we didn't spend a lot of time in body armor because reconnaissance required us moving and living literally off the land and doing special reconnaissance. So I'm not super f uh, fond of body armor, except for the fact that it is a means of holding your equipment and offering ballistic protection. Like no doubt, right? That's, that's the point. A, a lot of guys, and I think our civilian uh, guys, get wrapped around this whole idea of body armor. When I was a contractor, for example, I didn't carry body armor to wear myself. If I was doing low-vis operations, like I'm wearing this, minus the flag and maybe the denim, um, maybe if I was in Yemen, I would have a trunk full of body armor. It wasn't for me. It was for my case officers or for support personnel that I potentially had to rescue or provide security for. Because if you're an asset, because you're doing the shoot, move, communicate, you most certainly have liabilities. So if your family is your liability because it's your kid, he doesn't know how to shoot, move, communicate, not yet. Maybe your spouse. Well, you would want them in body armor because you want them to be ballistically protected because they don't have the tactics, the skill sets to defend themselves. So when you have the skill sets, the idea, at, at least in special operations, is lighter is better. There's not a real debate around that. A lot of units have debated it. There's a whole thing, 670-1, where you have to wear certain, uh, you know, the uniform expectations are specific for units. Uh, battalion commanders, brigade commanders put out, hey, memorandums of, uh, of understanding, or basically, you will do this. And that's a thing. But in special operations, it's mission dependent. If we don't need the body armor, we're not gonna wear the body armor. Now, it's not like Black Hawk Down where you take the back plates out kind of idea. It's the idea that, hey, if you're lighter, you're faster, you're more agile, and you have the tactical advantage. So 
Um, I've used all of these types of armor through the years, starting with, in the infantry, um, flak vest. Like a flak vest is like, you know, to use the Ninja Turtle analogy, because I like ninjas and turtles, um, and I grew up with them. Um, I wanted to be one. Michelangelo, that was my guy. Who was your guy? Leave that comment below. Some, some guy's going to be like Leonardo, and he was so egotistical. Michelangelo was like the cool guy, right? Raphael, the outlier, whatever. Uh, I'll, I digress. So we're looking at RBV, Ranger Body Armor, and flak vest. I mean, literally on hand grenade ranges, throwing hand grenades with a vest that had no tactical application in war. In Vietnam, there was body armor, but nobody ever used it because they didn't want to die because they were overheated in the triple canopy of Vietnam. And we took a lot of casualties because of it. I mean, if I had body armor accessible, depending on the circumstance, I probably would have been wearing it. There's some good medical statistics about a lot of casualties we took where people were shot, they could have survived, and they winded up dying because of the um, distance to first aid and upgraded care. They died because they didn't have armor, right? So this certainly saves lives. And when I evolved from RBA, Ranger Body Armor, and to the GWAT, the Global War on Terror, all of this started accelerating. People were like, oh my gosh, we need kit. My first trip to Afghanistan, we didn't have the right body armor. We had these big like flak vests and we went, man, we need plate carriers, like a thing to hold the plates on our body. So being a good 18 Bravo, I went down to Bagram and I used the operations fund, which I was allowed, and I bought from the Chinese manufacturer in Bagram, homemade, Chinese made body armor, kit, plate, hanger, thingamajiggies. They didn't have the armor, but it was the holder. And we were running around with Black Ops. That's the name of the company back then. It's funny, if you're an old school Bagram guy, you know this. Um, that was holding our plates on our person. Now, the combination of the plate evolution and the holder have evolved greatly. The best body armor I ever carried on my person was made by Paraclete. Paraclete was in North Carolina. They were revolutionizing uh, special operations uh, body armor, accessories. They had every accessory. CAG, the SIF, Ranger Battalion, we were all wearing it. My biggest regret, man, I'm, uh, and whoever this guy is, please hook me up. I Craigslist sold my Paraclete body armor um, when I got out of the military because I didn't think I needed it. Not with armor, because back then you couldn't do that. Um, but my carrier for like 500 bucks. That's probably worth like a million dollars at least. I will pay you $505 if you're the guy who bought my Paraclete armor. Um, why was Paraclete the best? Because it was slick. Like it had a cummerbund, like life-changing cummerbund. This, this doesn't even have a cummerbund, but it fits really comfortably because it's fitted for me. But the cummerbund like was the underbelly that attached and kept you real safe and secure so you could run, so you could jump buildings, so you could uh, building climb in counterterrorism operations. And it was very slick and small. Um, back in the day, this is how much we hated body armor. If you were a guy like me, I'm 6'1", 200 and 25 pounds, 25 pounds on, a, on a good day. I would wear extra small plates. Like, I had like an index card of body armor on my chest, like this big. So if like you were a really good shooter, man, uh, I prayed for that good shooter. If you sucked, uh, I would Swiss cheese. But it, the idea was like, if I could run that body armor this big, then I could be more agile. And I had to wear body armor because depending on the mission set and the unit, they just made us do it. So the lighter, the better. Then we evolved into Eagle because Eagle won the contract in Special Operations Command. No offense to Eagle, but it wasn't like Paraclete. Then came along Caleb Cry. Um, we work with uh, uh, Cry Precision, with Ernesto, big shout out to Ernesto, and all the guys at um, uh, uh, Cry Precision. Game changing. Changed the entire world of not only uniforms, body armor, uh, pouches and accessories, but camouflage, because they had multicam. So all the things that Caleb brought to the modern GWAT, uh, starting at CAG, and then working itself down, revolutionized Special Operations Command, period. And now, when I look at the end of my career, where I was wearing cry precision cages, and then JPC, I ran, for most of my career in Special Operations, 
I ran the jumpable plate carrier. Why? Because I needed low vis, not low vis like operationally wise, but low signature. Like I couldn't have bulky stuff because I was free falling into outer space at 25,000 feet and I, didn't, I couldn't have a plate carrier that was gonna come up and hit me in the face or a bulky set of armor that I was going to try to navigate around while navigating to the ground in free fall. So the jumpable plate carrier became my mainstay. Um, I've always used steer tactical in some component. When I was a reconnaissance sniper, I used their recce rig. And then when I became a civilian and couldn't afford uh, a lot of this stuff, I started working with Tier Tactical and this is the Pico, um, I, I might be mispronouncing that, but this is one of my favorite setups for the release of the kit, uh, getting in and out of it, and also the accessories. Now what you'll notice in my civilian kit uh, with the accessory pouch on the back that has basically a GP pouch for all my goodies, and then on the front, um, it's very slick. I never ran a lot of stuff bulky out here because I was a sniper. I had to lay on my belly and to be able to engage a target. I had to build in climbing, build in climb slick, so I had to have my body close to the actual obstacle. So any of this kit going this way was a no-go. This is why I like this setup because you could put things on the side and I'll run three mags in front, but sometimes um, I wouldn't even run that. So why is this good for civilians? Well, it's about the liability versus the asset. I don't think about donning this when uh, crap hits the fan. What I think about is my loved ones. Like if you have kids, just imagine, just take the person you love and how are you gonna operate with them if they don't have the capability? It's like uh, in prison where you're like, pull out your pocket and you're like, hold my pocket. Kind of like that. But it's now your loved one. I mean, you'll get smacked by your loved one if you say that. But what I'm saying is you say, hey, don't think through this problem that's very stressful. Attach yourself to my, my belt. Grab the back of my shirt and stay behind me protected. And then you're doing all the gunfighting. Well, if you're doing that right, they're protected, but what happens if they're not? Because you can't cover 360, they need body armor. That's one consideration. The other is carrying the crap, and then obviously the ballistic protection, depending on the scenario. I mean, the Hollywood shooting of two uh, dumbasses that are willing to go rob Bank of America and then get in a shootout with AK-74s or 47s, whatever they had, SKSs, and just do what they did, they were shot multiple times but because they had ballistic body armor, they were protected. So I recommend you do have plates. Plates level three alpha is a minimum for me. There are some police departments that don't even have three alpha plates, that have two alpha soft armor. That, like those days are long gone. Um, I run prime armor plates in here, which are very inexpensive comparatively, that civilians can buy. I recommend, recommend that you get those. And then training in this. Most often, my body armor was stuff that I used to load bear weight to get the training out of it because it affects your, obviously, your physical stamina and your endurance and your strength. So this morning, for example, I was on a treadmill um, doing intervals with body armor. Yeah, I still do that because I want to load bear um, I, and I want to be better. So. Guys, I covered a lot. Uh, I didn't go into details about the, uh, the kit setup. The bottom line is it depends on the mission. So there's so many variables to that. What I will say is it's applicable for civilians. Um, I don't mind seeing civilians train with this. Just understanding the reasons why is why I'm doing this. I love that context. I wanna give you my experience from the, the GWAT and the evolution, and certainly my narrow field of experience is not the end all be all solution. There are many justifications, there are many reasons why people run different types of kit. I just wanna share with you my experience. Like, subscribe, hit the notification tab, and make sure you leave comments, because I, I want your feedback, because if you're like, Mike, you're the coolest ever, I want to hear that, and if you're like, Mike, you're a scumbag, I want to delete and block you. Just kidding, uh, just kidding, but seriously, I'll de delete and block you. Um, but make sure you leave your feedback on what you want to see next, because this is all about you guys. I don't get paid to do this. Um, if you want to help me get better prepared with my company, Philcraft Survival, the link's down below. Till next time, peace out.